I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this, and he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. So this starts to get into the crux of the matter of AI, which is obviously AI is this huge boom to society. In many ways, it helps people. It increases corporate profits, which in turn help people further. But there's kind of a dark side to it. So if we're starting to replace the people who are delivering the food by auto driving cars, if we're starting to replace the teachers, the artists, the workers who shelve factories, so everybody from blue collar to white collar, you know, the bank lending officers and so on, the fear is billions of jobs will be lost around the world. I think people, you know, I think there is um, unbelievable attraction and addiction to hard work because hard work comes out with rewards. A and meaning, as you mentioned earlier. And meaning, yes. Rewards in terms of um, financial fame, um, sense of accomplishment and actualization. This can become addictive. And uh, that's what I fell into. And I think the societal values uh, rewards that. People admire you if you work hard or and certainly rewards you when you're successful. But when I was faced with uh, the possibility that I had only a month to live, it suddenly realized to me none of this really meant anything. That the only things that uh, were meaningful to me was spending time with the people I loved and doing the things that I loved. And then I realized how foolishly that I had lived and I vowed to change my ways uh, if I could get better. And, and I did. So I now work maybe 20% less. And it was that awakening and epiphany that when I saw AI might take a lot of routine jobs away, I think actually for the very long term, it's good for humanity because we continue to fall into this trap of downward spiral of continuing to be addicted to work and seemingly prove that we're worth something. But in fact, uh, when we pass on and die, uh, we won't be remembered. So it's, it's really a matter of um, giving back to the people who love you. I've got one of my favorite human beings in the world, Kai Fu Lee here. Uh, first off, by intro, uh, he wrote a, a great new book. I mean, this is a, a book that everybody in America should read. I'm sure everyone in China is going to read it, but it's called AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. And it deals with such interesting questions like, what, what really is AI? how it's going to change the world, how we could potentially react to it in terms of, you know, will it cause lost jobs? Who, who are going to be the winners in terms of, you know, the different countries and companies involved? And also it has some very personal stories in there as well, which we'll, 
we'll get to. But first, I also want to say, Kai Fu Lee, you know, you know, you've been, you know, you you were running uh, Apple's speech recognition back in the early '90s. You're you're probably the reason now there is a Siri and Alexa and so on. I don't know if you take credit for that ever, but you probably that was the work you did when I when I knew you 25 years ago. Uh, then you you helped run Microsoft China, then Google China, then uh, you started your own investment firm, Sinovation. And you've been you've been you've got 50 million followers on China's social media. You've been neck deep in all the innovations and the growth of capitalism and innovation in China. And now you're back here to tell that. But one more thing before I, I let you talk, you two you had. T- two or three influences on my life. One is you were involved in convincing me to go to graduate school at Carnegie Mellon when you showed me uh, your, your, the speech recognition work you were doing, uh, which uh, your, your software had to recognize commands that were on a Navy battleship. That was the state of speech recognition at <laughs> the time. Right. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of my graduate school career, I went to you with one last chance of something I might be interested in. I wanted to work on, you had made the world champion Othello program, and I wanted to make a program to work on the game Go, and you said it wasn't possible, so you said no to me. But you were right, because it wasn't until 2017 that Google, using the AI uh, company DeepMind, made AlphaGo, which beat the world champion of Go. And uh, and your your work on your Othello program really influenced how I thought about AI and you know how it wasn't you know as portrayed in the movies where oh somebody's just going to wake up and be like Scarlett Johansson in Ex mm-hmm. Machina AI is really about understanding data and statistics and neural networks in such a way that it could ideally make our lives better. Uh, I don't know if you have a different definition of AI. Oh no! Hi, it's great to see you again, James. It's been a long time. Yeah, it's been uh, since, since 1991, I think. That's right. <laughs> Although I, I, we follow each other on the internet, and yes. I hear you tell my stories from time to time. Very yeah, ac- yeah. I've I've read about accurate. you a couple of times. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, no, I think your understanding of AI is the AI of to- AI of today. Uh, we call it the artificial narrow intelligence in the sense that it works in a narrow domain with one objective function and with huge amounts of data, it uh, generalizes incredibly well and beats humans regularly. Um, but then it's not the artificial general intelligence or AGI, which is uh, human equivalent in terms of in addition to a narrow function, uh, AGI would also be equivalent to people in terms of common sense reasoning, multi-domain reasoning, planning, strategic thinking, creativity, self-awareness, maybe even emotions. I well, think well, that's a lot there. of different things. Like for instance, creativity, AI could potentially understand data from the brain. Oh, what music makes people feel happy? What makes them feel sad? What do they enjoy? And then AI could potentially use that data without being necessarily creative. AI can use that data to create music or art, for instance. Yes, as long as there's an objective feedback. So if there is a clear tagging for I'm happy, I'm not happy, I like it, I don't like it, uh, it's the stock went up, the stock went down, the person paid back the loan, the person didn't pay back the loan. As long as there's an objective label or tagging, AI can learn the skill. So so like, uh, let's take pay back the loan, didn't pay back the loan. Okay. So um, the way I think of of AI now is... You have lots of, let's say a new person comes in, wants a loan. There's a lot of data about this person, whether it's a man or a woman, uh, what state they're from, what's their job, what's their income, what's their prior payment history, what kind of house do they own, what kind of car do they own. Maybe there's other data. Maybe there's Facebook-related data, what, what bands they like, what books they like, who knows. There's a lot of data about the person. And go, if, if an AI program examines data from millions and millions of people who have been labeled payback loan, didn't pay back loan, and you have all the same data about each one of those person or each one of those people, potentially AI can now label the new person likely to pay back loan, not likely to pay back loan. That's exactly right. And the amazing thing about AI is it can take, uh, you know, you describe what we humans think of as the top seven or eight attributes about paying back loan, but AI can go to thousands or tens of thousands of attributes. For example, we, uh, as a VC, we funded a company called Smart Finance, and they built an app. And you basically apply for your loan. 
In addition to filling out those seven or eight pieces of information, you also push a button to have it take information from your phone that is at the same level that Facebook, YouTube, and others take. And with that data, it can look into what apps you have installed, uh, what's in your contacts, uh, whether the contacts uh, numbers are legitimate, and uh, uh, whether you have a lot of gaming apps, what kind of phone you use, how often you use your phone, as well as um, uh, what day of the month it is, uh, which relates to your payday potentially, and as well as things like that seem like they should be irrelevant, but are all contributing to a small extent, like your battery level. So 3,000 mm. features were taken, uh, actually more than 3,000 features were taken, and the AI learned that there were 3,000 degrees of correlation. So for example, battery level is one of the least useful, but still barely useful features. But if you're always at a low battery level, if you always let things go to the edge. Yes. You know, but here I'm trying to rationalize it. My rationalization is not important. Mm -hmm. The AI just uh, determines statistically this it, it conjoined with these other 2,999 features lead to a decision. My yeah. rationalization is just my human way of putting That's meaning right. into it. That's right. It just means uh, for the last 10 million people who did pay back the loan and the 1 million people who didn't pay back, battery level was more correlated with uh, uh, well, those who had more battery was more correlated with the group paying back. Those who had, had almost no battery was more correlated with those who uh, didn't pay back. Could could, uh, could people game the system? Like in the sense, could I have two phones and like I keep all my games on my other phone, I keep this battery level high, uh -huh. and I'm going to give you this phone. Like if people understand, they can game the system a little. Of course you can. That's why I'm telling you one of the least important features, Just battery <laughs> level, because that... That would not tip the skill, you know, right. ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the case. So it doesn't really help. I'm purposefully giving a feature that's uh, barely relevant, but still relevant. It's it's interesting because I don't want to get too weeds onto this one thing, but this does remind me, of course, uh, of you know, we just discussed you had built the world world champion Othello program, and you used a set of features and you labeled each game won or lost, and you had the, the program play itself over and over again, and that's how you, you created this, this world-class software. What's, what's different now? There's obviously a lot more features, but also is the AI discovering what features are important? Yes, it is. Um, so back in the days I was in grad school, the features were largely selected by experts, and then the AI could combine them. Because at that time, we could combine maybe four or five or six features, otherwise the, the matrix multiplication gets too cumbersome, right? So five by five matrix multiplication, that was manageable. But nowadays it's 3,000 by 3,000, they could be done by GPU. So the big difference is there can be a lot more features. So basically you just throw everything in and you might as well throw in the ones that are raw uh, without human processing. How does the AI avoid what's called curve fitting, where uh, it thinks there's a statistical correlation, but there isn't? Uh, well, by having enough data and by tying the various parameters together so that it's trainable. So it's always a ratio of how much training data you have versus how many connections you have in your deep neural network. So, so if you have enough data, it might be on the first thousand cases, oh, it looks like this feature is important, but then you look on the next thousand cases, it's probably constantly testing whether a feature is as important as a thought. That's right. And it can choose to um, make the matrix very sparse. If 3,000 features you fit in, feed in, there are only uh, 100 useful ones, the rest will be a sparse matrix, which will barely um, make a difference in the final outcome. And again, the, the model for this, I mean, you use the term neural network, but it really strikes me as mostly statistics. And the reason I say that, the reason I don't like the word neural network so much, and you, you could disagree, is there's this whole branch of, let's call it science fiction AI, where the computers are suddenly going to wake up. And that's not really what we're talking about here. We're, we're, we're talking about using data to understand humans and life and and systems in a way that computers weren't able to previously. Yeah, I think that's that's fair to say. Mm -hmm. um, most people who use neural network are the word artificial, artificial neural network indicating is not the same as our brain working. Uh, there are some uh, inspirations based on the 
today's uh, uh, AI design that there are neurons, artificial neurons, artificial connections, which are trained by weights, and that's by no means equivalent to the way our brains work, but it, it was inspired by the architecture of our brain. And I, and I always thought there was, particularly in the early 90s, I always thought there was a, a little aspect of neural networks that they called it neural just because it was easier to get government funding that way <laughs> by saying, hey, we're going to wake up, we're going to have a new brain here. Uh, could be. <laughs> could so, be. So you talk about, uh, you know, there's, there's three reasons why this book is, is such a must read. A, you, or maybe four reasons, you really define what AI is and the different types of AI and where it's heading. And where it's heading is just amazing. And this is not in the long-term future, but in, even in the short-term future. You also discuss, and this was kind of ins oddly inspirational to me, capitalism in China is, is cutthroat. It's brutal. Yes. Like It really struck me as much more capitalist than the US. I mean, these people go at each other and in very innovative business model ways that, that aren't restricted have no restrictions on them. Yeah, it's a winner-take-all environment. Um, it's not clear what exactly caused that. I think maybe uh, a lot of Chinese entrepreneurs have been poor for 10 or 20 generations. So the desire to really make it was incredibly important. And um, I think the, or the origins of the Chinese um, entrepreneurship was copycat, right? Copying the U.S. ideas. And once people all learned by copycat, they feel they need to, in order to win, uh, they not only have to win, everyone else has to lose. Otherwise, there's always going to be a copycat who raises uh, $100 million and copies your technology and price competes with you. So if you want to be the only winner left standing, then you have to come up with some business model that is uncopyable, that's so, so impregnable. You, you, you spoke about the example of the copycat version of Groupon in China. So first off, Groupon tried to team up with Tencent, the, the, the one of the biggest internet companies in China, or maybe the biggest, and they lost because the copycat version of Groupon dominated. Maybe you could talk about that as, as an example. Sure. Um, I think Groupon plus Tencent at the time just had too little ambition. It was going just going to replicate whatever it did in the U.S., and by that time, China had already significantly advanced so that uh, at least one of the 5,000 copycats of Groupon. Derived. Right, there were 5,000 copycats. That's right. Uh, and only one survived to date. The other 4,999 all died, uh, exactly as the uh, gladiat gladiator uh, analogy I made. Uh, it was like a coliseum with 5,000 people entering. They battled each other, only one survived. And the survivor, of course, came up with an impregnable business model, which was that they were going to change the way Chinese people eat by delivering the food uh, not only within 30 minutes while it's still hot, uh, including the cooking time, but also make it so cheap to deliver at 70 cents per delivery. And, and that's done with a, a lot of uh, uh, wonderful AI, but also a lot of unbelievable operational excellence. And I have to say the, the um, tr almost a trickle-down effect from the, the government mandate that, hey, these businesses need to be funded. So, I mean, ultimately, to, to lose money for a while so you can gain market dominance, you need to be well-funded. You need some sort of venture capital welfare to... To, to lose money for a while. <laughs> well, yes. If you look at all the money that's poured in to these 5,000 Groupons, it's probably 10 or $15 billion. Uh, in the end, the company Meituan is worth $55 billion. Right. So it was, uh, it was worth it. The overall VC got a decent return, maybe 3x return. But if you weren't in Meituan, you lost it all. <laughs> if you were in Meituan, you made maybe 100x. But what, what was interesting is, is that... In, in America, it seems there's this emphasis on focus. Like if you're going to be Groupon, be Groupon. If yeah. you're going to be uh, uh, Uber, just be the platform where you know the, the drivers join to the platform and the riders join to the platform. Don't be anything else. If you're going to be Airbnb, just be the platform where ha you know empty houses can sign up and people who need empty houses can sign up. But it seems like... You, w and focus is rewarded in the United States, but in China, it doesn't have the same restriction. Like your example with the ride sharing company, Didi, they not only have the platform for the drivers and the riders, but they also own the gas stations and the auto mechanic shops. That would never yeah. happen in the US. That's right. 
They also have in, uh, joint ventures in insurance, car leasing. Uh, they want to control the whole chain. If you think about the weakness of Uber today, it's because Lyft could more or less compete with them in selected cities because as long as you can get a car in three minutes, you might as well download two apps. Yeah. And each driver might as well uh, be drivers on the two platforms. So the way DD avoids that is they own the entire chain, and if you're a DD driver, you enjoy the benefits of lower cost insurance, leasing, uh, gas, and repair. And the moment you take a competitor on as as a second driver, you will be kicked out of the uh, DD ecosystem. So, so the reason I think that that the U.S. and China are different in that specific way is that Uber can argue because the purity of its business model that they deserve you know, a thousand times profits valuation. And and that, and Wall Street rewards that. Wall, Wall Street, you know, auto mechanic shops are valued at five times earnings. Yeah. Yeah. Technology companies are valued at a thousand times earnings. And if you yeah. mix the two, you have to figure out valuation becomes complicated. It doesn't seem the same issue happens in China. I don't know why. Well, it's just math, right? I mean, if uh, Wall Street ought to be sophisticated enough to take a conglomerate, that has five businesses and apply appropriate multiples and do a um, hybrid, it would seem. Right. Um, yeah, but back to Meituan, you know, delivering the uh, food 30 minutes to every home in at 70 cents, that required hiring 600,000 people at minimum wage um, and also uh, suffer the turnover and the training that's required because these are not people who could get a uh, job on the factory floor at the Foxconn. So they're willing to make less. And yet you have to attract them, train them, make sure they're courteous, and also have a rating system. So if they're not, they're um, uh, fired. And then they will turn over because once they learn all the manners from you, they can get a better job. So you have to manage that cost. Then you have to figure out how to deliver. You know, Uber Eats is not the answer. The answer is electrical mopeds charged on batteries. Then you have to deal with changing of batteries. So it's an incredibly... Um, cumbersome, hairy problem to solve. And is the AI involved in the logistics? Like, yes. who do you deliver to first, fastest, and so on? Right, so it's a matter, it's a more fancier version of Uber because you've got restaurants to pick up orders, people to deliver them to, and then your battery, which runs out and needs to get changed, um, and all that in, in, a, in, a eco, in a system, plus a, the equivalent of surge pricing. Because once you don't have enough people picking up, you won't meet your 30-minute deadline, then you gotta give people incentives to uh, wake up and uh, do the do the delivery. So it's very very complex. And and how do you deal with? I mean, it must be like management principles in China must be different from here too. Because if you have six hundred thousand employees plus your your normal business that you're supporting, the management issues must be complicated to keep people motivated to keep people uh, uh, with a certain vision, knowing that some part of your working class is gonna. Um, uh, quit every three months and, and others that you want to stay for life and, and so sure. on? Well, it's a clearly a um, uh, two-class citizen kind of an environment in which I think, think of them as, uh, you know, think of them as Uber, right? Mm -hmm. The Uber drivers versus the Uber AI programmers. I think that's not too dissimilar. But the thing is, if you're willing to take that hairy a problem, once you solve it, you could be worth $55 billion like Meituan versus Groupon, only a few billion and that on top of that, you have such a high barrier of entry that a competitor would have to spend easily $5 billion, if not more, plus hire 600,000 people, plus do all the things you've done, uh, plus probably lose money for a long time. And if they never get down to the operational excellence, down to 70 cents a, a, a delivery, then even if you get to $1.70, uh, at 25 million orders a day, you're losing $25 million a day. So that's the stakes and the risks that you'd be taking um, in that, such a competition in China. And then, you know, you also described the the so-called copycat Airbnb, but what's different from Airbnb here is they, in many cases, own the homes. <laughs> right. Well, if you look at buying a giant building that might be constructed in a modular fashion, uh, and and it's um, it's consistently managed. The cost goes way down. And also, if you look at the Chinese traveler, they're not so much traveling for leisure. They're more traveling for the kid's school or for um, someone's ill and your, your uh, son or daughter who needs to 
so basically live near a hospital to accompany your parents uh, as they travel to another city where there are better hospitals. The entire dynamics are different. But this in, this inspires me about about capitalism. It, oddly, reading about China inspires me about capitalism and entrepreneurship here. Right. You would think someone from maybe Airbnb would read this and say, oh, you know, it's not a bad idea to own buildings near hospitals or, you huh. know, because that's obviously an issue here too. Uh, or, or, I don't know, it's just, it was so fascinating. And to see how cutthroat too, between the different chatting uh, companies, how they would try to destroy each other. Yeah. And here that's largely restricted and, and regulated, but there it's like, everybody's going for the throat. They're, they're killing each other. Well, there's only one winner at the end in each Colosseum. And even when you become the winner, you, you upgrade to the next Colosseum. It's like a video game. So Mei Tuan, after winning the food delivery, moved on to movie tickets and travel. And uh, before you know it, they'll be uh, fighting it out with Alibaba. And the, and the same thing, I thought it was fascinating. WeChat has become this sort of mobile app of apps. Like you would, it becomes a platform for building apps, which is, I guess, similar to the iTunes store, but not quite. Like that, the app platform is more hardware and API related. This is more uh, f the functionality is built within WeChat to make apps. Yeah, so WeChat, think of it as the, is the uh, uh, Swiss army knife that has within it uh, WhatsApp and Facebook. But on top of that, it's a one-button access to pretty much everything you ever want to do. Uh, think of it as having an Amazon embedded, as having a Grubhub in embedded, um, as having Uber and Airbnb all one button away uh, with with your uh, and also connected with payment. And so, so what's fascinating about that is you have these companies doing, and this is related to the to the AI and your point in the book about about China potentially getting ahead of the U.S. in AI and how important that is. When you have one app or one program or one company that has access to so many different types of data, and we're talking about a hundred times Facebook times data, uh, and already data with Facebook, you know, they, they're appearing in front of the Senate, it's such an issue. When you have that data, you're gonna know everything about the person and then all of these factors and variables to figure out what my next decision is. I mean, the, the, pro, the software will know before I do what packages I should be receiving yesterday. <laughs> You yes. know, and it will deliver it yesterday. <laughs> well, the software will know better than you do what you want to eat tonight, what vacation you want to take, uh, at some point, um, who you want to date. Yeah, I mean, I imagine, like, what's, if you were to say, what what's the AI outcome that you're most looking forward to in the next few years, what would it be? Uh, well, looking forward, that would be healthcare and education, because that's universally good for humanity. And we're actually just beginning a lot of investments in these areas. But honestly speaking, most of our existing investments are in things that are more like uh, face recognition um, and finance and uh, semiconductors and uh, autonomous driving. Those are where the money is. But the ones I'm really looking forward to are healthcare and education. So let's take face recognition as an example. So this was the thing that 30 years ago AI wasn't able to do, but now AI can very successfully do it. If mm -hmm. I see someone, let's say, robbing a deli 50 yards away, it, right now in America, if I wanted to recognize who this person is so I can track them down, I would have to take a picture, but then do some sort of deal with Facebook, which has the largest collection of faces, and and hope that they would tell me who this is. And maybe they might get it, maybe they wouldn't. Is there a in China right now, or, or is the AI moving towards a better solution? Well, I think in China or the U.S., if you have a proper camera installed in most convenience stores or banks, uh, that would, if that's high enough resolution and that's connected to the police um, a database of criminals, at least you can match that robber with the, um, uh, the criminal database and see if uh, matches are triggered. But in China, if I'm connected to WeChat, instead of the police database of criminals, I maybe can find the criminal that much faster. I'll have more photos and more, uh, more people that I have access to photos of. Yeah, I, I don't think WeChat would allow that because you have only access to the people you know. So it's like Facebook, right? It has an upper bound of 5,000 friends. Right. So you could find out if one of your 5,000 friends committed the uh, robbery, but that's not too useful. So, so 
Uh, although it might be in my case, I don't know. In education, you know, you mentioned how it's, you know, we, we've, since the 19th century, a lot of our educational system is, you know, this force, this factory style force feeding of facts and, and it's kind of a one size fit all, no matter what the child might be talented at or interested in. How do you think AI can change education? Well, I think the teacher does a lot of routine tasks that uh, we don't usually think about. For example, uh, giving homework assignments, grading them, giving tests, grading them, doing the drills, uh, correcting pronunciation, correcting grammar, um, doing the sim simple math drills, and the uh, and, and the course, and of course the uh, the lecture. Um, may not be best given by each individual teacher, but maybe there are great teachers who could give it. So the combination of AI doing all these tasks plus MOOC, uh, I think can really make AI much more, uh, education much more scalable because AI can do a better job than the teacher on let's say half the tasks, freeing the teacher to become more of a mentor. So that is the uh, vision that we have uh, in China because China has um, schools with a highly variable uh, capability teachers like villages would have uh, pretty poor teachers with limited experience and cities there could be great teachers so we're trying to connect um, them up so that the best teacher can teach a class of 800 uh, using clicker as an interactive mechanism and also AI can go in and replace all those homework and tests and that's already uh, beginning to be put in place how would AI replace the homework I don't understand uh, the AI would assign uh, potentially different homework to each student based ah, on their... it would know which student is having problems in what yeah, areas. Yeah, and then it would grade them automatically. So AI can already grade homeworks for not only multiple choice, but also fill in the blank, um, chemical equation, uh, math proofs, and even in, uh, uh, even English and Chinese essays. So, so this starts to get into the crux of the matter of AI, which is obviously AI is this huge boon to society. In many ways, it helps people. It increases corporate profits, which in turn help people further. Uh, but there's kind of a dark side to it. So if we're starting to replace the people who are delivering the food by auto driving cars, if we're starting to replace the teachers, the artists, uh, the, the workers who shelve factories. So everybody from blue collar to white collar, you know, the, the, the bank lending officers and so on. The, the, the fear is billions of jobs will be lost around the world. And, and um, you know, and you discuss all the options, like should there be a universal basic income? Uh, should there be a basic income that, that is paid to people who volunteer for, gov for, for, you know, services that might improve society? Uh, you come up with a lot of uh, interesting solutions. But I want to first ask about the foundation of this. When, when ATMs developed in the U.S., you know, it, it seemed to replace the bank teller. You still need to get bigger. You can't have the same profits every year. You need to get bigger and bigger every year. So does that solve the problem at all, just this need for more profits? Or is still, do we still have the problem? <laughs> Oh, well, you're talking about, you know, Schumpeter's uh, theory of creative destruction, of course, and that's certainly capitalism with larger volume could create more jobs. But I think the issue is uh, in, in this particular case, uh, in the case of AI, we're, we're largely replacing the um, routine work so that we're not transforming them into more work. In the Industrial Revolution, when artisans who made cars were turned into assembly line, more jobs were created. There were being there were lower level jobs, lower paying jobs, but there were uh, tens or hundreds of times more of them. So uh, unemployment was not not an issue. Uh, I think in the banks' case, uh, the game banks were made more profitable with ATMs, but I think they actually hired uh, uh, transitioned a lot of the tellers into uh, customer service, sales, and upselling. So I think that is uh, workable, perhaps for some industries. Um, but I think going forward, uh, we're going to be talking about some bank is going to come out that has no tellers and no and and no um, no branches. We're already seeing that. 
um, there will be um, convenience stores with no um, no clerks. There will be restaurants with no cooks and waiters, and and those who choose to go for the lowest cost will win a, probably a large part of the business. Because after all, when we go to banks, convenience stores, and fast food places, we're not looking to socialize with the waiters, waitresses, and cooks, and uh, clerks, and uh, tellers. So the human component is not not so important. Therefore, I I do think. Um, s- many of the companies will choose to go fully automated so as to minimize cost. And then when users start to see, oh, if I go to this branchless bank, I get one more percent in interest rate. If I go to this um, humanless convenience store, everything's 20% off. If I go to this hu- um, uh, automated um, uh, fast food, the food is half the price. Then enough people will go there so that what grows is the fully automated or mostly automated processes, right? Because, like, take McDonald's as an example. Um, you know, this is this huge. It's the largest restaurant chain in the world. It's also this huge ecosystem where high school students yeah. make enough money to pay yeah. for their basic needs. And you're saying that potentially in the future that might not not happen because. As a po- it's not like there's going to be your McDonald's concierge who says, "Hey, are you happy right. with your food today?" Or here's why don't we recommend the quarter pounder instead of the Big Mac? You, you, humans are just not going to want that social interaction in those cases. That's right. I think you know Starbucks might or might not be okay. Uh, Michelin restaurants will be in great shape because there will be a lot of people. Uh, there will also be a lar- larger number of ultra rich people because as wealth in this, um, inequality increases. So uh, there will be high-end uh, restaurants, services, travel agencies that offer phenomenal concierge services, but that's a smaller number of uh, jobs uh, uh, for uh, compared to the large number that, that would be automated. And, and when you have this level of wealth inequality, it's hard to look at it for an example in history where there's this kind of inequality where something bad didn't happen to stop the inequality. I mean, both in, I mean, China is a great example in the, in the sixties where the inequality, you know, through, through violence was largely eliminated, but you know, now the inequality is rising again and, uh, you bring up some solutions. So let's talk about that. Universal basic income. Is that a realistic thing or will people have incentive to not work so they can qualify for universal basic income? Uh, I I think universal basic income alone will not work because it is, um, first of all, it's incredibly expensive. It's given to everybody. That's too wasteful. Uh, But most importantly, it is a way to give people, fix the income loss problem, but it doesn't solve the loss of meaning problem. Because many people, um, including most of the people who work routine jobs, uh, basically associate their work as the meaning of their lives. So that when the work is gone, even if there is so-called UBI or welfare uh, money for them to um, basically survive and uh, uh, live and eat and, uh, uh, and be safe, that is not what they want. People, I think, live for meaning and uh, increasing in the last um, few hundred years. Uh, especially through the Industrial Revolution, most people believe uh, work hard and uh, earn a good living and provide for the family as their primary reason for living. And when that's taken away, I think people will likely uh, fall into depression um, or um, substance abuse or even suicide. Uh, There are a lot of studies that shows people unemployed for 6 to 12 months or longer uh, have a much higher tendency for substance abuse, um, depression, and suicide. Even if they were on benefits or making small income from the government or whatever. That's right. Well, most people in the U.S., 6 to 12 months of unemployment, they are covered. Mm. But I think that doesn't stop the, uh, the depression or unhappiness. People really want something to do so that they feel, you know, it's the Maslow hi- hierarchy, right? When the basic needs are met, People want to be respected and want to feel there's some degree of self-actualization. And it's funny because with AI, uh, it's almost like we need an AI Maslow's, you know, 
pyramid of needs because all our needs, even intellectual, might be satisfied, but then it leaves us with nothing left to do. So, so, so you so you take UBI and you go further in, into some innovative solutions, like you suggest maybe a UBI that's tied with volunteer efforts. Right. Um, but uh, how do you how does a how does a government afford that? How do people afford that? I think it can be done incrementally. For example, today there are a million positions in elderly care that's open and available, but people don't apply for it. It's a mismatch. It's not. It's not as though um, uh, the the jobs are available, but they're not paying enough. That's basically the issue. People don't want the job because it pays too little. So if the government wants to have a um, uh, investment or an incentive, but not overdo it by UBI or universally giving. Uh, money for volunteerism. Uh, one interesting first step is to: can there be enough subsidy or tax deduction for people who take on the specific job of elderly care? I wonder if that could be more entrepreneurial than government funded, so that there mm-hmm. becomes, for instance, hiring agencies that develop that focus on elderly care, or 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 hiring agencies that develop into industries that aren't replaced completely by AI. And so maybe there still becomes innovation in industries that happen as a byproduct of AI solving all of our other problems. Sure. I think corporate responsibility is probably a lot easier to achieve than um, having massive spending by the government. Uh, Companies like Amazon are putting in place training. Uh, Jeff Bezos was talking about training to become nurses And I'm pretty sure he's thinking about the warehouse workers who over time will be replaced by AI and robotics. And you make, you make the interesting, somewhat cynical, but, but it point, but it's also worth asking, of course, companies are interested in providing this retraining because they don't want something bad to happen if there's massive inequality. So there's both sides of this. We want to do good, but also we're afraid of the bad. Yes, yes. I think, well, Amazon is a great example. It's the first trillion dollar company. Uh, they, they are a beneficiary of AI and robotics. And uh, they have all these warehouse uh, workers who will be out of a job if they're not trained. Uh, it will leave the Amazon brand tainted. And also, I think every company um, should increasingly learn to become good uh, citizens of the society so that their responsibilities don't stop with their shareholders and employees and customers. And I wonder if the shareholders will reward them for that, because essentially you have to train the shareholders to reward them for that so that there's incentive for them to do this. There has to be incentives always. Well, that's why Amazon is a good example, because uh, Jeff has uh, consistently um, done pretty um, uh, courageous things against the shareholders' uh, preference and proved to be right. You know, I also want to touch on, you know, you mentioned AI and medical care, and you experienced this firsthand uh, several years ago. You mentioned in the book, you came down with stage four lymphoma. And just to, to summarize your story, you were so, you were so high, you had worked so hard for so many decades and you were so highly respected in China. You were called teacher Kaifu. You had 50 million social media followers, but you realized that when you were confronted with your own mortality, that you know having an impact, maybe you needed to focus a little bit more on the people closest to you, the people you loved. Side by side with that, you also did your own research and realized it's not all about stage one, two, three, four. There are maybe thousands of factors involved in medical diagnosis. And you did your research and realized it wasn't as bad as you might have thought. And thankfully, you're sitting here today with us, you're, you're fully cured and a changed person as a result. What do you feel changed most with you when you were confronted with your own mortality? We're, we're similar yeah. in age, so I'm always yeah. interested. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I know you're not a workaholic anymore, right? <laughs> it's true, I'm not. You Except used for to these be. podcasts. Yes. That's right, it's wonderful. <laughs> I think your lifestyle is the lifestyle uh, we admire and um, uh, should increasingly move towards. Uh, I think people... You know, I think there is um, unbelievable um, attraction and um, addiction to hard work because hard work comes out with rewards. And, rewards. and meaning, as you mentioned earlier. And meaning, yes. Rewards in terms of um, financial fame, um, 
sense of um, accomplishment and actualization, this can become addictive. And uh, that's what I fell into. And I think the societal values uh, rewards that. People admire you if you work hard or and certainly re rewards you when you're successful. But when I was faced with uh, the possibility that I had only uh, months to live, it suddenly realized to me none of this really meant anything, that the only things that uh, were meaningful to me was spending time with the people I loved and, and, and doing the things that I love. And then I realized how foolishly that I had lived and I vowed to, to change my ways uh, if I could get better. And, and I did. So I'm now uh, really changing my own priorities. So I would put my family's priorities first. Uh, when, you know, when they needed me, when they want to take a vacation, I just don't work. Fortunately, I'm a venture capitalist. My days are not required to be, uh, you know, five days a week or, or whatever. I can take more time off uh, as they need it. Of course, they're still aware that I love my job too. So their, their requests are reasonable. So I now work maybe 20% less, um, but, uh, but that, that would, that's enough to uh, just in time to spend the time with the family uh, when they want and need it. And when I do spend time with them, I wholeheartedly spend time with them. I don't take my phone and my com computer and open it up. Um, and, and it was that um, awakening and epiphany that when I saw AI, might take a lot of routine jobs away. Um, I think actually for the very long term, it's good for humanity because we continue to fall into this um, trap of uh, downward spiral of continuing to be um, addicted to work and, and, and seemingly prove that we're worth something. But in fact, uh, when we pass on and die, uh, we won't be remembered. So it's, it's really a matter of... Um, um, giving back to the people who who love you, so that and then and also that I think for the AI uh, that takes the jobs away. Well, what jobs could be created? Um, I because of my own experience, I would think we have to create jobs around compassion and love, um, not just not just voluntary jobs, but jobs that have an economic value, but maybe just not enough jobs that are including teachers and nurses and nannies and jobs that include psychiatrists and uh, elderly companion, elderly caretaker. I think those jobs can absorb a lot of the people who may lose their jobs due to AI displacement. And these are compassionate jobs um, are not only large enough in quantity, uh, they don't require a whole lot of training, a lifelong training. And also, I think at the end of the day, I, I got to think someone who took care of uh, two elderly people have got to feel better at the end of the day than someone who just did repetitively did the same thing on the assembly line. And, and you know, I mean, I think this is, that's so valuable. Like what you went through, how you then analyze your own illness which of course, by the way, it seems to have informed some of your thinking on AI that every situation is different. Maybe uh, when we're educated to be a doctor, we learn stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, sort of fitting everybody into the same bucket. But the reality is every type of cancer is different. Every type of illness is different. Every human's different. And AI with the massive amounts of data can more quickly, accurately diagnose, recommend cures, protect, potentially uh you know, process those cures in you and so on. Uh, but then there's the flip side where, okay, as you mentioned, many jobs will be displaced because AI is going to infiltrate every area of our life. And we have to learn how to find meaning in perhaps compassion and love and so on and find the jobs for that. It could be the jobs you mentioned, could be entertainment. I mean, I imagine the entertainment industry, while it's massively changing, won't be displaced. You know, you still need... Um, story writers and and so on uh you know what you know one thing one thing i you've experienced so much in the history of innovation and silicon valley and and the growth of technology in china you're really you you you've been in you, you've had your legs in both uh kind of centers of technology that have that have 
risen up and you've been you've been in the center just having been at apple microsoft google and all the places in china can i ask you just a, a few names and what you mm. think of them in a sentence or two sure bill gates you were running microsoft china or you were heavily involved in their chinese strategy you worked there for a while what, what do you think of bill gates well i'm incredibly impressed with his big heart and how he transformed himself from um from a, a very successful business person into uh, a very responsible philanthropist who actually uses his IQ to understand how he could um, put his billions at work to make humanity better. Steve Jobs. Well, I'm, f I'm just uh, blown away by his uh, brilliance and his combination of uh, artistic as well as technical skills to integrate and build things that people don't know what they need. I mean, we're used to thinking about understanding users and building what they want. Steve is uh, one of the very few people uh, who could build something that you don't know that you want, but once you see it, you really want it. How do you think he was able to do that? I think he has must have a gift uh, and, and his combination of um, uh, incredible communications uh, skills and access to technology at the right place, right time, connecting all the dots, and maybe the time that he spent on the uh, high mountains in India uh, gave him some revelation. No idea. Uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Uh, I think Larry and Sergey uh, are amazing technologists who um, basically created a miracle by building, uh, I think, an amazing high IQ, small team culture, and, um, and uh, with very consistent value throughout the, the company. And I think it's also trying to do something big with Alphabet. We'll see if that works in turning a, a one product company into a conglomerate um, uh, and, and essentially using technology and AI to change the world. I mean, certainly with our acquisition of, of DeepMind, plus the enormous, right now they probably have more data than just about any other company in the world, probably even including at this moment, Chinese companies. Do you think they have a chance to be the, the ultimate winner in the, in the AI race? I think if there is one company that could be the winner out of the AI race, uh, it would be them. Although I don't think it'll be one company, but I do think they're ahead of everyone else. And, and Amazon as well, because they know so much about our purchasing behavior. Uh, Amazon doesn't have the AI depth that Google has, but I think Amazon has that um, willingness to do whatever it takes to win and thinking ahead in terms of business strategy. So it has kind of the best of both the Chinese and U.S. worlds, and I think it's that business genius that, uh, that I admire. Yeah, because if you look at the, how you describe Chinese companies, maybe Amazon's the closest cousin in that, in their their online to offline efforts, they they do have some AI in the sense that they want people to shop in their stores without yeah. any clerks. Uh, uh, they do the they 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 kind of pioneered the recommendation engines. Right. Um, so so I guess to to close off, what what is the next step in AI? Because I sort of feel like when you and I spoke about AI in in 1989 or 1991. You know, I sort of see what's happened is since then, and here we are in 2018, computers have gotten a lot faster. There's a lot more data. There's more people who are AI engineers, but that would have happened naturally. But really the thing that's changed AI, I feel, is more data, faster computers. What's the next real innovation in AI, if there is going to be one? Well, I think uh, actually think the biggest thing in the next 10 to 15 years is penetration into every industry. Uh, the, the, I think we, sometimes we just forget how much things have changed. When you and I first met, I had 100 megabytes of speech data. <laughs> now people have 100T. That's you know, a million times more data. And the, 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 the power that has to help every imaginable business, I think is the biggest deal ahead of us. If I had to pick... Uh, one or two big breakthroughs. I think one would be an autonomous vehicle, truly working without any human intervention. 
that's probably in the 10-year kind of horizon, technically, might take longer due to other reasons. Um, another is uh, basically um, use DNA sequencing combined with um, uh, targeted, personalized AI medicine and cure that might cure uh, cancer or other, uh, other, other types of um, uh, health issues. And then lastly, is maybe a little controversial, something that can remember everything in my life and then I can uh, um, intelligently index into any part. So it truly augments our memory, uh, not as an implant, but just as a device that remembers. So Kai Fu Lee, uh, thank you so much for coming on my podcast. The book is, or your most recent book is AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. And I didn't think the China part would influence me that much, mm. but it actually inspired me as an entrepreneur. Like it's just, it was so fascinating to see entrepreneurship from your view and how it's taking place now in China, which is relatively new to it. It was just fascinating. But also your view on AI, which I have valued for 30 years. Huh. And and then your stories of your own illness and, and, and what you got through that, I think is so important for people to read. I think this is an incredibly valuable book to understand business, the future, what's happening, and how we personally can react to it. And thanks once again also for saying no to me when I wanted you to be my PhD thesis advisor and work on an AI Go program because I didn't re we didn't realize then it would take another 26 years to, to happen. Yeah. So thanks once again. Hey, you're welcome. Great to be on the show. Thanks, James. Thanks. That's so, that was great. Thank you so much. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.